You really shouldn't be going anywhere, Velvetrimmy chided as we made our way towards the Stable Tech building. Itself walled off from the rest of Philadelphia, like Stern City in miniature. Except to a medical clinic for a week or two of recovery. She was probably right, but we couldn't afford a week. I felt guilty for having selfishly stolen most of the day for resting. But once my magic had grown strong enough to lift little Macintosh, I knew it was time to move. A small family of scavengers spotted us on the street and scurried for cover. It hurt to think that ponies once greeted each other as they passed on the street. That cheer and open neighborliness had once been the social norm. In the equestrian wasteland, a stranger pony was met with guarded suspicion. Assessed first for threat potential. I gave the scavengers a smile and a friendly hoofway as we passed. I wasn't returning as they cringed. The adults hid the younger ponies behind them. Weapons ready should we attack like a band of raiders. I hated the equestrian wasteland. Especially Philadelphia. Oh my! Velvetroni burst out, eyes wide with wonder. Aren't you just magnificent? She trotted quickly ahead of us. Pyrolite was perched on the fountain statue of Sweetie Belle, glowing brilliantly. She had bled off most of the endowment from the Philadelphia crater, but her aura was still five times her size, lighting up the Steel Ranger's outer courtyard with golden radiance. My heart went out to the Balefire Phoenix, immensely grateful for her companionship while I was behind the wall. I too began to trot towards her, a tear in my eye. My pit buck started clicking, informing me that in prior light's vicinity, was even less healthier than bathing in Philadelphia's water. I drew up short and watched Velvet f watched as Velvet floated a bottle of Radsafe from her saddlebags. She drowned more than a remedy's dose before trotting up to the radioactive bird and nuzzling her gently. Pyrolite cooed. Well, at least Velvet Remedy wasn't spending nearly as much time inside the Fluttershy Orb since Pyrolite joined us. I had mixed feelings about the trade. All the ponies in this crowd are crazy, Zenith muttered as she walked past me. I moved up to Zenith. Um, this building belongs to the Steel Rangers. I think maybe it's not safe for you to come with us. Would you mind waiting outside? It won't be alone, and I hope it won't be for long. I consider, uh, Zenith considered me. And whom do you intend to keep me company? I needed, I knew I needed to climb these combat prowess backing me up, just in case my meeting with Blueberry Saber went south. Not only did I want a Steel Ranger at my side, for diplomatic reasons, I didn't trust him alone with Zenith quite yet. Velvet Remedy on the other hoof would enjoy having some time with Pyrolite, and I certainly wasn't taking the glowing ball of regal radiation in with me. I told Zenith my decision. Zebra nodded. As you wish. I'll remain here with the unicorn Fluttershy and her balefire doom bunny. Okie dokie loki. Perhaps you could work on that brew you offered me, I suggested, taking a plunge. I wanted to show the zebra my trust and give her something to do while we were gone, that she could find productive. I didn't really want to be altered. I had a hard enough time entering the memories of folks whose bodies were significantly different than my own. I didn't even know how I could handle living in one. But Zenith was right. Red Eye had his own advantages. I had to at least seriously consider putting my squeamishness aside and taking those offered to me. Zenith smiled. As you wish. Those fires I reported yesterday appear to be the work of Red Eye's private army. Griffins sporting the slaver's king colors were spotted flying over the far side of the Everfree Forest, carrying incinerators. But, where are any other woods would be consumed by the flames 
by now. These fires are spreading extremely slow. Looks to me like the Everfree Forest is fighting back. DJ Pone 3's voice came out from the wall of speakers in the Stable Tech Visitor Lounge. We listened as we waited impatiently. And one last bit of news for all you faithful listeners. Looks like Red Eyes set his sights on Tempony Tower. Fortunately for the folks in this place, it's built like a fortress, and the only entrance is both well defended and tricky to access. The ponies of Tempony Tower have barricaded inside, safe and sound for now. There's plenty of stockpiled food and water, and the new constable's chef, or chief, is doing her best to organize rationing. So, they should be able to hold out until help arrives. I jumped to my hooves at that. No! I shouted at the speaker. They're not trying to invade. They're trying to seal you in. And now for something a bit unusual. I don't normally read mail in the air, but I have a personal message here from my assistant homage to the stable dweller. Ahem. <clears throat> Dearest little Pip. Ah, ain't that sweet. I think some pony has a crush. Dearest little Pip. I know things sound bad here, and I know it's your nature to try and rush to our rescue, but we're okay for now. And you have other more pressing matters to attend to closer to home. Do what you need to do. Take care of them first. Then, later, we can meet where we met before. And I promise to give you so many or- Oh, well, that was not something I'm comfortable reading on the air. I think I'll be having a little talk with my assistant. Meanwhile, hearing the silky smooth tones of Velvet Remedy singing, about what gets her through life in this post-apocalyptic wasteland. God. I stared at the speaker, my body locked up, my jaw on the floor. He rushing to my face and other places. Velvet Remedy's beautiful voice poured through the speaker, replacing the voice of DJ Pone 3, but I barely heard it. What I meant to say was, I can't believe she just did that. What I actually said was something closer to, Squeak. Calamity snickered, tears in his eyes, then collapsed onto his back in laughter. What do you mean the Elder isn't here? The Elder's been called out on urgent crusade and is not available, Night Poppy Seed claimed. However, she said that in the case you should return, I may receive what you have recovered. I stopped. I was under the impression that these things were important to you ponies. Or at least to her, considering I risked my life for them and all. She wasn't actually expecting you to survive, Steelhoof deciphered. From his tone, he wondered a few words with the Elder himself. I glared at the mayor in magically powered armor. Fine. I can report that Red Eye's research into bypass spells has been destroyed. I hadn't scavenged any of it. And have not, and would have not given it to these ponies even if I had. But I did know that at least part of the research had been successfully completed. I could tell her that. But really, fuck these ponies. I recovered the schematics to the radiation-powered engine, and I'm ready to turn them over to you. After having made copies, but I didn't feel the need to tell her that. I had no problem giving the Steel Rangers this technology. I intended to give it out to any pony with a chance of implementing it. This was the sort of step forward that all Equestria could potentially benefit from, but not if it was being jealously guarded by only a few. That said, I'd be damned if I wasn't going to get something in return this time. In exchange for access to the Stable Tech mainframe. Night Poppy Seed stuttered at that. Uh, I'm sorry, there's no way... Calamity stepped up next to me, fixing her with a dangerous stare. I reckon we ain't asking. Y'all old little pip, and we're taking payment. Now why don't we do it all friendly-like? The Nightmare looked to Steel Hooves for more support. I'm a Star Paladin, my armor and case companion reminded her smoothly. In the absence of the Elder, I am the ranking ranger on this base. And I ordered you to take us to the Stable Tech mainframe. He turned to stare to me. I will personally make sure little Pip doesn't access any information vital to the security of the Steel Rangers, or 
the Ministry of War Wartime Technology. Lad Papacy nickered, but turned obediently and began to lead. Permission to speak freely, sir? No. The room was dark and cold, save for blinking lights in the mainframe. From the locks in the door, the turrets outside, and the hoof prints in the dust, I could tell this room was not only restricted, but rarely entered. I hoofed the light switch, but the room remained dark. I turned my pitbox lamp and looked around. The spotlight on Steel Hoof's helmet hummed softly to life, cutting a beam of light through the darkness. He followed me in. Instead of moving directly to the mainframe, I allowed my curiosity to drag me around the huge basement floor. At the far end was a huge, gear-shaped door of a stable. It rested against an open doorway, not attached. By removing my saddlebags, I was barely able to shimmy through the entrance. According to the number, it was stable zero. Beyond stretched the rooms and hallways of stable maintenance wing, but the hallways dead-ended in shallow corners of dirt. The rooms were unfinished. Toolboxes and construction equipment lay scattered everywhere. Several sections of the wall and ceiling had collapsed. In one corner, I found the curled-up skeleton of an earth pony. The floor around the pony was littered with empty bottles. I shook my head as I noticed the liquor had been Applejack. There was a black opal lying on the floor next to the tattered remains of the recollector. A low bone of the lower bone of the earth pony's left foreleg was an early model pitbuck. I plugged my pitbuck into it and found a single audio recording. Sitting down, I let it begin to play. The voice on the recording was soft, almost overwhelmed the background noise of sirens and bombardment. I don't really know how to say, or for what matter, whom I'm saying it to. The good news is that Sweetie Belle's got my family safe and sound and stable too. I don't know where Scootaloo's at, but I'm glad she's not. A particularly loud roar drowned out everything else, followed by the sounds of metal and concrete collapsing within the unfinished stable as a maelstrom devoured the city above. Billy Delphi was just hit. That's it then. It's all over. Every pony's dead, except for the ones we could save. Celestia, damn it, Applejack. Couldn't you just have stopped this from happening? Couldn't any pony have stopped this? I heard a furious clicking. I checked my pit buck, but the radiation meter was safely in the green. No, no, no! I didn't mean that. Ain't Applejack's fault. Hey, it's more my fault than hers. And I know I ain't supposed to feel that way, but sometimes I do. And I guess it don't really matter anymore. Everypony's dead now. I'm dead now. I didn't survive the mega spell just because I lived through the blast. We never gonna even got the door on. Radiation will kill me. The clicking was coming from the recording. I just wanted to tell any pony listening that I'm sorry. Even if it's not my fault, all those kids are dead. I'm still sorry. I tried to make up for it. I really did. Steelers were calling for me. I'm fine, I called back, wiping tears from my eyes. I'll be out in just a minute. Before worming my way back out, I knelt down and picked up the memory orb in my teeth. Once back in the basement proper, I put the orb in my saddlebags and proceeded to the stable tech mainframe. The mainframe was a tricky hack, but either I had grown more skilled or Pinkie Pie's had been easier. I downloaded all the information I could on various stables and began sifting through it for the one piece of information that interested me most, the location of Stable 101. I found it, and the answer surprised me. Once I was reunited with my friends outside the Sea Ranger Citadel, having given Knight Poppy Seed the schematics I had promised in return, 
I told every pony what I'd learned. Stable 101 was built within the Everfree Forest itself. The looks and gasps were exactly what I'd expected. Apparently, there used to be an old castle on a safe patch of land in the middle of that place. That's where Stable Tech built their last completed stable. Zenith was the first to make a particular connection. So, Red Eye is building his fortress in the middle of the Everfree Forest, and is burning down the forest around it? Why? Hard to maintain a growing army in a space where the wildlife wants to disembowel you and suck out the juices, I imagine. Calamity theorized. Agriculture, I answered with my own guess. You said it yourself, Calamity. The Everfree Forest was never hit by a mega spell. As far as cropland goes, the Everfree Forest is one of the few places that isn't poisoned with radiation or taint. Zenith agreed with my line of thought. And after the burning, the soil will be rich with nutrients from the ashes. She looked grim, slipping unconsciously into the part of rhyming speech that was used. I was used to hearing from Zakora. I worked for months recycling flamer fuel for CERN. Clearly, he was stockpiling plenty for this burn. And when he's done, he'll put up a wall around the whole place and have completely control over the food. Steelhoofs agreed, glancing back towards the wall that Rod had erected around two-thirds of the city. It's what he does. Do you think she'll like it? Apple Bloom asked, fretting over an exquisite model of an abs almost a monastic walled village. The design looked familiar. I had seen the remains of the model on display outside Elder Blueberry Saber's chambers. She'll love it, I heard myself say. The voice was not immediately familiar, and completely lacked the country draw of the younger mare. This Apple Bloom, dressed in a manner of formal attire that she did not yet grow comfortable with, was no older than me. Do you think she lacked the carnations? She loved the crenulations, my host asserted, her gently. The crenulations are fine. How about the moon in the center of the courtyard? Maybe I should have gone with a full moon rather than a crescent moon. She'll love the moon. The moon is fine. Apaloon trotted nervously around the table, eyeing the model from every angle. The room we stood in was a glowing white marble with flowing curtains and gold... Uh, green around the accents. If we weren't in the palace, then somebody had gone to great lengths to give the impression of one. How about the tower? Is it too short? Maybe it's too tall. That bloom hoofed her ears in frustration. Ah! I don't even know if Princess Luna lacks towers. Why didn't I ask her this earlier? My host let out a long-suffering whiny. She'll love the towers. The towers are very nice. Apple reacted like she'd just been struck. Nice? But they need to be perfect! Apple agitation was strong enough that she nearly hovered. I thought the young mare could spontaneously combust from stress. Calm down, child. I'm sure Princess Luna will love all of it. I felt myself smile, smile as soothing words came from my muzzle. Princess Celestia, one of the greatest architects and all of Equestria for this project. And she made sure she got it. Apple Bloom quaked a moment, then calmed with a breath. Thank again, Uncle Orange, for accompanying me to meet with the princess. I don't think I could have done this on my own. You're doing far s a far sight better than your sister ever managed, but try to watch the country draw. Remember, sound sophisticated and show every pony that you are sophisticated. Yes, Uncle Orange. I'll... I'll... remember. I've been returned to fretting, but a more subdued fretting. You should be proud, 
Uncle Orange said encouragingly. This is the sort of project that will make you renowned all across Equestria. Apple Bloom simply nodded. The frame didn't seem to interest her. However, with the bits I get from this, I'll, sorry, I'll be able to expand my, my business, hire more help, maybe start looking into other sorts of designs. She looked up with a smile. Scootaloo said she'll like to invest in that now the Red Racer is doing so well. Maybe build a company together. Apple's voice fell away. Another presence entered the room. An exalted one. My host dropped gracefully into a bow. Applebloom swiftly followed his example. I was in the company of a goddess. Not one of those blasphemous pseudo-goddess alicorn monsters. I found myself kneeling before the goddess of the sun, whom I had prayed since I was a little filly. Celestia herself. She was majestic beyond description. A tall, white, proper alicorn, whose mane and tail flowed with color, her flank emblazoned on with the symbol of the sun itself. She was graceful, kind, and altogether sovereign. Please, she addressed us gracefully, rise, my little ponies. It's a joy to see you. As my host stood, Princess Celestia, squee, 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 moved around the table, eyeing the model favorably. So, this is to be Luna's new academy? Applebloom nodded, uh, nodded nervously, unable to speak. It looks lovely. Applebloom squeaked. Thank you, your majesty. Celestia's ears perked up. Ah, and here she comes. Would you be so kind as to let me speak first? Of course, your majesty, my host said quickly. Celestia moved, and both Applebloom and her uncle followed the glorious princess's gaze. Princess Luna walked in between, between two curtains. Her dark blue colors looked striking, yet starkly out of place in the rest of the palace. She was much smaller than her regal older sister, or for that matter, than the pseudo-goddesses, almost the size of an old pony. While Princess Celestia was repleasant, Princess Luna struck me as cute. Sort of cute that I would have impure thoughts about if the pony in my head wasn't already too busy bouncing around Pinkie Pie style and letting off a barrage of squeeing noises. Sister, you called for me? Yes, Luna dear. I've been thinking about that school of magic you've been proposing, and I've decided to send all your students to the moon. Luna froze. Her mouth hung open, then closed slowly. You wouldn't. I could see the gears in her head start spinning again. And you couldn't. Without the elements of harmony, you don't have anywhere near the kind of power you did, dear sister. What was going on here? Applebloom apparently either not quite in on the joke, or simply unable to see Luna made uncomfortable, quickly spoke up. She means Crescent Moon Canyon. Princess Celestia smiled, but tilted her head towards Applebloom, with a look that suggested the regal princess hadn't wanted the young architect to spill that quite yet. Princess Luna shot her sister a look that moved the table. And moved to the table. Her eyes going wide. This? She looked up with tears in her eyes. This is going to be the Luna Academy for young unicorns? A magical school of my very own? Just like yours? Princess Alunia smiled and nuzzled her younger sister. Happy birthday, little sister. Apple Bloom's mouth hung open until my host tapped his hoof. <clears throat> Blushing, she waved a hoof over the model. Princess Celestia has given... She paused, looking up at the princess to make sure it was okay to speak. The princess smiled with a nod and softness in her eyes. 
us Little Horn Valley in the Crescent Moon Canyon to build on. It's isolated, far away from any dangers, or any villages, Princess Luna noted, giving her sister a gentler look, but a look nonetheless, and far away from Canterlot and your own school. Princess Lustia nodded. I want you to have this fairly, without ponies making the comparisons they would if the schools were side by side, and without the students being distracted by rivalry. The princess flickered her gaze to Applebloom as she added, And I know you were considering Ponyville, but I didn't want young colts and fillies wandering off into the Everfree Forest. Luna rolled her eyes. Come on, big sister. No filly is foolish enough to go wandering around that place. Have faith in my students. Abloom was making the sort of face that suggested she really wanted to be someplace else. The only thing within a day's wagon ride of Littlehorn are some zebra jungles. Yes, Celestia nodded. There will be friendly zebras not far away if they need assistance. And soon, Several of your students will have baby dragons of their own. So if any pony needs to contact you, you'll only be a sneeze away. We were airborne between Philadelphia and Manhattan. As much as I wanted to go straight to Ten Pony Tower, the warning that DJ Pwn3 had sent me was at the front of my thoughts. So I had directed Calamity to take us to Junction R7 first. If something nasty was brewing in Shattered Hoof, something that Homage thought I needed to take care of first, then I wasn't going to waste any time. That still left me a lot of time to think. And most of that time was spent thinking about the memory orb I had found beside poor Apple Bloom's skeleton. My inner pony had taken over a day to stop dancing at having seen the goddesses, and it was almost harder to prevent myself from living the memory over and over than it was to fight the urge for party-time mentals. And at least with the latter, I had the help of simply not carrying any to take. The craving came without an ease, easy way to stifle them. But this, I couldn't throw a memory orb of the goddesses away. It deserved to be enshrined. I momentarily played with the idea of taking the cathedral for myself wanting to transform it into a temple to Celestia and Luna, with the memory orb as a sacred relic. It was a silly daydream, and it passed. I also caught myself revisiting the notion of Luna clopping me with her wings, only this time as the fantasy, rather than a swear. I thought I caught myself before my imagination could get too far, and punished myself by banging my head repeatedly against the side of the Sky Bandit, until Calamity threatened to land. It took a while before other implications of what I had seen started to sink in. Littlehorn. It was a name I had heard in several contexts. The Watcher's words stood out. The massacre at Littlehorn broke Princess Celestia's heart. After that, nearly midway through the war, Princess Celestia decided that she wasn't the right pony to lead Equestria anymore, so she stepped down, abdicating her position to her sister, Princess Luna. I looked around. The other Remedy was lost inside the Fluttershy Orb once more. Pyrelight, her aura merely twice her size, had cradled herself against Velvet's left shoulder. I was snorting loftily. I shared the Sky Bandit with Steel Hooves and Zenith. Climate was ahead, pulling us. Well, if there was any pony who would knew, it was Steel Hooves. What happened at Littlehorn? Steel Hooves and Zenith both stared and started to answer. They looked at each other before Steel Hooves answered me simply. Disaster. I shivered, knowing I didn't really want to hear this. A part of me needed to. Tell me. Littlehorn was a school. Unicorns, fillies, and colts. 
many of whom were too young to even have their cutie marks live there, being trained by some of the best of Equestrian's magicians. Still have started slowly. One evening, around twilight, a little over nine years into the war, a zebra convoy rolled into Little Horn Valley. Two dozen zebra legionnaires and three large covered wagons. When they didn't respond to peaceful overventures, the matron of the school activated the school's defenses. They didn't know your language, Zenith interrupted. They weren't frontline soldiers. It was a refugee, coward boy. Mares and small zebra children, just trying to get out of the killing zone. I know that, Steelhoof shot back harshly. They realized that when the first wagon was struck, and they saw the dead. But by then it was too late. He turned to me. It was too late. The zebra convoy had assassins wearing zebra stealth cloaks. They had one, Zenith corrected. A father whose family was killed in your school's surprise attack. They only needed one, Steelhoofs growled. The school was full of children, and the zebras set off a gas bomb inside. It was Canterlot in miniature. The striped bastards killed every pony in Little Horn. I felt myself crying. Okay. Please. I don't want to hear anymore. They weren't paying attention to me. But then, I wasn't being very assertive. I was still numb with heartache. Little old porn had been the turning point of the war, and the pony in my mind was realizing, with tearful sorrowness, that Little Horn had rippled out to destroy every pony it touched. I began to understand. The architect Applebloom's sense of guilt, and how it steered her choices, and that would have been nothing compared to the guilt and sorrow of the now, of the then Princess Celestia, who had herself chosen the location, or the effects of Princess Luna, whose beloved students were the ones slaughtered to the last. It was after Little Horn that the damned zebras went totally manticore shit. Every fight became one to annihilation of other of one side or the other. We struck one wagon, and yes, it was a mistake. They massacred hundreds of small children, and then went completely insane over it. It had nothing to do with Little Horn, Zena said solemnly. The war had changed. It wasn't about coal or gemstones anymore. Coal and gemstones? But then, that made a lot of sense. The zebras weren't like alicorns. They couldn't cast spells or use magic directly. Ow. They had to brew it into potions, infuse into fetishes, or otherwise bind it into objects to get their magic to work. Now, with the possible exception of soul jars, Gemstones were the ultimate receptacle for magical enhancement. Any society advancing through arcane sciences would acquire trains full of gemstones. That was easy for ponies. We had lands rich with them. Rock farms for growing them. But if the zebra lands didn't have gems, but they did have coal. I was pulled out of my mental distraction when Steelhoofs advanced on Zenith. Then admit your whole damn species had a fucking mental break. Not mine, Zenith insisted. We saw that you ponies had fallen under the influence of the stars. No quarter could be given, and no mercy expected from a nation under the sway of cosmic evil. What? I mouthed, as Steelhoof screamed. Did you, or did you not, choose to follow the companion of the evil stars? Nightmare Moon. What? Are you... What? Stuhus turned, stomping, and paced until Calamity once again threatened to land the Sky Bandit to give us all a talking to. Wait, I said slowly. Are you saying that the reason the war had gone so bad is because the zebras couldn't tell the difference between Princess Luna and Nightmare Moon? From a struggle over resources... To holy war in ten seconds flat. They're not the same fucking pony, Steelhoof screamed at Zenith, although more now because he couldn't scream at the zebra for the past. We 
we weren't following Nightmare Moon any more than Princess Celestia imprisoned Luna on the fucking moon a thousand years ago. The Sea Ranger was shaking. They are not the same. Velvet Remedy had come out of the Fluttershy Orb and was looking on in confusion. Sulu's turned to the both of us and barked. Tell her. They are not the same thing, I said firmly, then took note of the silence beside me. I turned to look towards Velvet Remedy. Honestly, she whispered, I was never too clear on that myself. I always figured it was some kind of psychotic break. Ah! Steelhoof sounded murderously, which, considering this was Steelhoof's, actually scared me. Psychotic breaks don't come with a physical transformation. I nodded in firm agreement. Unless you were Pinkie Pie's hair, I thought, remembering that weird change at the end of her argument with Twilight Sparkle. Shilhu was visibly shot, shook. His voice changed from an angered yell to a low, even blade. Then, there was never any real chance of diplomacy after that, was there? I could tell that behind his visor, his eyes were locked on Zenith's. The invitation to Shattered Hoof Ridge, for peace talks. There were never going to be any peace talks, were there? Zenith's ears flattened. She tried to be reasonable, apparently realizing this was no longer even an unfriendly argument. I wasn't there. Please remember that these were other people, zebras, and ponies alike. Not us. Answer the question. Zenith looked away. From the tales I've been told, she sighed sadly. Peace was what was hoped. But there could only be peace if Nightmare Moon was removed. Unfortunately, the pony set the wrong princess to Shattertooth Ridge. The night turned infinitely colder. I waited on my nerves for what Steel Hooves would do. With a final growl, Steel Hooves removed himself to the furthest end of the Sky Bandit and crouched down, pretending to sleep, which I knew he didn't, but I thankfully played along. Y'all okay back there now? Calamity called out. My answer echoed Steel Hooves' answer. Tonight, Poppy Seed. No. We picked up the signal within a two hour setting down at Junction R7. It wasn't from Shattered Hoof. Distress call from Stable Tech Stable 2. Message begins. The mechanized voice gave way to one I had written off as never hearing again. The voice of our overmare. Little Pip, Velvet Remedy, if either of you can hear us, I pray that you're still alive, still out there to hear this. Please, if you, or if any friendly pony can hear this, Stable 2 is under attack. We don't know who they are, or where they came from, but they have somehow opened the front door, and are killing every pony inside. I've evacuated all the survivors, to the security and Overmare's wing. But now we are cut off from the orchard and are running out of food. The invaders seem content to wait us out. If you can hear this, please save us. My blood turned to ice. I finally analyzed the signal. The broadcast was being piped through the same transmitter that the father of a dying cold had once tapped into under the cistern of Big Macintosh Memorial. The mechanical voice returned. Home. Message repeats. This is an automated distress call from Stable Tech Stable 2. Message begins. Oh, goddesses. C Calamity? Turn around! We have to go to Stable 2. Fast! Uh, Lil Pip? I'm about to collapse here. What's the... I pulled out my ear bloom and played the message aloud. Within ten seconds, 
Calamity was already banking and pulling us into our new heading. No, Steelhose whispered. Damn them, no! I swiveled towards my Steel Ranger friend. Know what? And then I realized what Crusade, Elder Blueberry Saber, had rushed off to the moment I was out of the way. I'm sorry, little Pip. I did everything I could to make them believe taking Stable 2 was a mistake. I have been for decades. But after you two showed up, they realized there was still a functional stable down there. This was your mission? I strode forward, my glare alone almost strong enough to disintegrate the Earth Ghoul Pony. Assess if Stable 2 could be safely taken? He cringed back from me. I even tried giving them Stable 29 instead. I rocked on my hooves. My mind teetered on the edge of a dark chasm as I struggled to remember if, in my own hack of Stable 29's entrance, I might have left clues that the tech-savvy agents of the Ministry of Wartime Technology could have used to figure their way through my own stable door. Velvet Remedies wrapped a hoof around me, holding me back. If the Steel Rangers are assaulting our home, she said, with steel in her voice, we might need him. Or, maybe it's just best we drop you off here, Clemity called back, fixing his steel hooves with an even stare. Because when I... Because I'm heading to Stable 2, and when I get there, I'm planning to kill me a whole lot of Steel Rangers. Footnote. Level up. A new perk. Bone Strengthening boo Brew. With this perk, your limbs will receive 50% of the damage they normally would. Note. Bone Strengthening Brew and the Cybernetic Implant perk. Admantium Bone Lacing are mutually exclusive. 